I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at SVGs, JavaScript uploads, and responsive frameworks. Let's check it out. First up is a primer to front-end SVG hacking. This is a really cool blog post that is basically just an introduction about how to include SVGs into your website. Now, of course, you can put SVGs anywhere where you can put images, but it's a little bit tricky. Sometimes there can be some tricky things with graceful degradation, and it's not quite as straightforward as it might seem. But this is a really amazing blog post. It teaches you how to actually include images in your CSS as something that's base64 encoded, and a really great way to get started with SVGs, which are really good if you're trying to create a website that's going to be retina ready or ready for high DPI displays. Yeah, very, very nice. Really good post. I, I definitely learned a couple things there. Check it out. Uh, next up, we have a project called toolbar.js. Now, this is really interesting. This is a jQuery plugin that creates tooltip style toolbars. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's a great example on the site. So here's this little gear icon. You can click on that and then, boom, get a little pop-up with different possible functions uh, for, you know, toolbar. So this uses the bootstrap icons from the Twitter bootstrap framework, which we pretty much can't get enough of and talk about here on the show constantly. Uh, supports a bunch of different configurations. It can be on the top or bottom of a toolbar. And then it's pretty easy to customize the number of items inside the toolbar. Uh, it really just has a little bit of HTML and markup that you use. Uh, it can be horizontal, vertical toolbars on the right or left. And then there are, of course, toolbars that can be triggered by a link. And then it has just a couple of different options for hiding the toolbar on click and things like that. So this is toolbar.js, and you can find a link to that in our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. Check it out. Next up is a really cool project from Intridia called Stately, which is basically an icon font that allows you to create maps of the United States. So let's say that you wanted to make a graph of the 2012 presidential election, or you wanted to show where all Intridians are throughout the United States, you could go ahead and do that. You can go ahead and scroll down here, copy and paste this markup into your page, and you can go ahead and style stately using a couple different styles here. They give some examples, and you can, of course, style individual states. So this is pretty useful if you just want to quickly generate a map of the United States and show some data about different states. Of course, you can't do this for the entire world. It's just useful if you live in the United States or you want to show data about the United States. But nonetheless, it's still pretty useful. Yeah, pretty cool how you can customize it too just via CSS. Yeah, yeah. It makes it really simple. You don't have to install any kind of crazy JavaScript, you know, mapping plugins or use Google Maps or anything like that. It's very simple and straightforward. Just, just have to make sure that you have your list in order. That's right. And, and don't leave any states out. That's right. Unless it's Florida, that's okay. Yeah, you can leave out Florida, it's fine. Next up, we have a project called dropzone.js. This is a jQuery library that kind of abstracts the HTML5 file upload API uh, right into a jQuery plugin so you can drag and drop uploads right onto your page. Now, the other cool thing about it is it supports image thumbnailing, which is pretty awesome. So you could just drop an image right there, and then it'll upload it and automatically generate an image for you. Uh, it's very, very easy to use, and you just include a couple of JavaScripts, and then you can also add just a class to your different form fields for files and dropping them and then it automatically creates it. You can also create the drop zones programmatically in a JavaScript tag. Uh, one of the really nice things about the plugin is it just abstracts everything away for you, so you only need to remember one API and not bother with just a ton of different JavaScript in your page. So um, check that out. Nick, have you seen the new show, The Real Developer's World? 
I I have not, but I have a feeling that we're going to see a clip of it right now. That's true. Nick, you know you could save yourself a keystroke if you typed in 60 instead of 100. What if I wanted to type in minute 15? It's 275. You still save a keystroke. Yeah, or you could just save yourself some hand movement and type in 77. Because no one cares about those extra two seconds. I mean, she's right. I've been wasting hand movement my entire life. Yeah, it's not very good. No, was, that was actually terrible. Yeah. What's next? Next up are labels in input fields, and apparently it's not such a good idea. This is a blog post that that's titled, Labels and Input Fields Aren't Such a Good Idea. <laughs> and basically, they're saying that you should actually use labels as they were originally intended. So, for example, you shouldn't put a label inside of a form field, like so, where, you know, you often see this design pattern where the text is kind of grayed out and it says something like email address or whatever you're supposed to put into that form field. And as soon as you click, it's gone. The argument that's being made in this blog post is that although you might be saving some space by removing that label, you're actually making a more confusing interface. So in this particular example, they have a reference URL and then they have two inputs and one says the Encyclopedia of Life and the next says Wikipedia. So you're supposed to put in a URL in the first spot and a, and a URL in the second spot. The problem is as soon as you click, you lose what you were supposed to put in there and it can be easy to just kind of forget or get your URLs crossed or not really know where you were supposed to put stuff. Right. So it's a pretty good blog post. It makes a, a really and you know good insight into the user uh, user experience of forms. And further down in the post they talk about the rise of the HTML5 placeholder which leaves room for further abuse of this particular design pattern. So very interesting post for people that are interested in user experience or UX. I guess the big takeaway to that is maybe use placeholders for examples and that labels are really good for accessibility and screen readers and things like that. Exactly. Uh, next, next up we have something called the JS compatibility table. This is a really great table listing the compatibility of different built-in JavaScript functions in a grid with different browsers across the top. And you can see if we take a look at it here, there's all of the different JavaScript functions available on the left. And as you scroll down, you can keep a view of what browsers do and don't support these different functions. And there is just a ton of different JavaScript functions that you can use. And then you can even filter it by typing in something like Geo, and it'll show you a list of all the different browsers that support that, uh, although that didn't exactly work for me right there, but trust me that it actually does later. I trust you, Jason. <laughs> you can configure all the different browsers that you want at the top of the screen, which is great. Um, and yeah, we'll have that in the show notes as well. Pretty cool. And it's really useful if you're developing like a JavaScript library or something. Yes, definitely. I thought tables were bad, but apparently tables are, are now good. They're good for tabular data. According to Jason. All right, next up is Sasa Perilla. I think I'm saying that right. Sounds like a parade. Yeah, or, or, you know, a root beer or something. It says, start your next project faster, or start your next web project faster with Sasa Perilla. Now, this is basically some SAS files that you can go ahead and include in your website to start a project faster, exactly as it implies. Now, looking at their documentation on Git, they say that this is, in fact, not a boilerplate or a theme. I kind of disagree with that a little bit. It's, it's definitely not a theme, but 
it certainly is some nice default styling to go ahead and get your website going, which I feel like is exactly what a boilerplate is. So it's okay to call it that. And the other thing that this does that's really nice is it, you know, sets up your fonts just great. I mean, it, it says here that, uh, you know, a method to produce the perfect book, you know, they give this awesome example of um, typogra uh, typography and uh, Sasper Sassaparilla is just great at that. Nice. Um, I think the, the big draw here is that it lets you work in pixels in your SAS files, but it gets trans translated to EMs when it's compiled. Yes, which is uh, super important. Yeah, that's going to be great for your responsive sites. Exactly. So uh, I think that's all we got for today. If you want to get some background on what we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. And who are you on Twitter? I am at Jay Cypher. Can't forget about that. I'm at Nick RP. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile development, or business, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. See you next week, and thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more advanced videos and tutorials like this one, go to teamtreehouse.com and start learning for free.